Uh, just going to take a little while to come through. Oh, that sounds promising. <laughs> It looks like we are live everywhere that we need to be. And let me just, where did that go? Come back to me. Yeah, so we are. Beautiful. All righty. All righty. It's taken us a little while, uh, much longer than we thought it was going to take. But finally, I'm... Uh, Happy, very happy to welcome everyone to the Iniquity Designer Dram Tasting Night. It looks a little bit different to what we were uh, originally planning to look like, but uh, the world has played against us. Uh, and I do want to congratulate everyone who's watching tonight and everyone who might be watching back on the replay uh, and to the gen two gentlemen uh, tuning in from South Australia. Congratulations on surviving the first half of 2020. Um, the odds were against us and I'm not sure that we're all going to survive the second half, but we've got this far. Let's celebrate and reward ourselves with some excellent whiskey. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, tonight and, and what exactly tonight is uh, and how it's going to play out. But my name is Scott Fitzsimons. To my left is my hired gun for tonight, Andy Milne from South Trade. Uh, and on the Zoom chat, Ian Schmidt and Vic Orlo from the Tin Shed Distillery down in South Australia, also known uh, as Iniquity Whiskey. Boys, how are we? We're good. We're good. good. We're good. Yeah, good. I hear it's, it's cold and wet down there. It's yep. raining. It was beautiful this afternoon, but not anymore. <laughs> Proper anyway. whiskey weather. Um, I want to say a quick good day to everyone who's watching on the on the Facebooks, everyone in the room. Um, so yes, this this tasting was essentially the first on tour version of a tasting that uh, you boys ran down in in Adelaide, where you had a room full of people who got some car samples and blended a whiskey together, um, which became a, a future iniquity release, which is what we were going to do in, in Sydney. Um, but unfortunately, travel and things aren't really playing in our favour at the moment. So what we're going to do tonight is everyone who's who's playing at home, and some people might not have, have sets, but you're more than welcome to stay along and, and add your two cents. We have six whiskies in front of us. Five of them are car samples uh, from various iniquity tin shed car samples. And then we have iniquity batch 19 which has been blended. And so we're going to go through all of this, talk about this process, um, and then actually try and recreate Blend 19 around us. So there's a few different aspects to this that we'll go through throughout the night. And I think what we'll do is we'll spend the first half an hour talking about the six whiskies individually, then the second half hour start playing around and putting them together, uh, and then the third half hour um, when we've all tried uh, six whiskies, God knows what's going to happen in the third half hour, so we'll <laughs> deal with that when it comes. Um, but, but guys, I mean, what, what sort of inspired this tasting setup, you know, that this sort of style of tasting? You mean the event or the way we put them together? The event, the, the original concept in a, a, a pre-pandemic world. We okay, thought we run of an article list called The Den of Iniquity, and we decided that it would be nice last year to give something back to our Martin list members and our fans. So we had that event you talked about. We booked out a restaurant. We fed 30 of our customers. We gave them all the whiskey samples and we said, go for it, make a blend. And if it's good enough, we'll put your name on the bottom of bottle. And uh, it was pretty well good enough. And we didn't put people's names on the bottle and we did bottle it. And that was batch 17, um, which we just sold out of, by the way. And it was a fun night. And we thought we'd do it again in Sydney because we had a lot of our Sydney customers say, well, what about us? Uh, as it turns out, we had to, we couldn't do it because of COVID. We were planning to go to Sydney to do the event, but then we thought, well, if we can't do that, let's do it the other way. We had to put batch 19 out because we needed the source of whiskey. It goes live tomorrow or the day after, depending on whether or not we get our act together. But the, the name of the game tonight is you've got the samples, or some of the samples that we used in making the blend. So we may have used only one of those, or we may have used two or three or four or five to make the blend in the little bottle, which is batch 19. And if you can identify the nearest milliliter per 100, in other words, the percentage of each batch that goes into the brew, then we'll give you a bottle of whiskey and a T-shirt. Yeah. So there are there are stakes tonight, which is why the, the hired gun is coming into, into effect. And there are, I know a lot of people who uh, are playing at home in, in groups have got mates around, uh, which is which is excellent. I think probably a, a very good way to, to do things as well. Um, 
do you want to quickly just talk through, I mean, I'm, I'm going to assume that a lot of people who are here tonight are an iniquity fans. I think you probably know, if you don't know by name, you know by face a lot of the people in the in the, the Zoom and on the Facebook and that sort of thing. But do you want to do a quick wrap up of iniquity whiskey, the tin shed distillery, you know, in the past sort of little while and, and where it's headed? Oh, well, we started in 2013. We were born out of an earlier distillery called Southern Coast Distillers. We had a bus stop with one of our partners that ended badly. And we started the new distillery tin shed in 2012, 1st of July. So, in fact, it's um, eight years old today. Uh, we've been blending and making whiskey since 2004. The Southern Coast stuff's been kept entirely separate from the tin shed stuff. Uh, Iniquity is the brand of whiskey. We've also got a brand of rum called uh, Requiem Rum, and the first one of that was launched just a few days ago, a few weeks ago. It's called the Ferret. And whiskies have got batch numbers to differentiate them, but we thought we'd do something different with the rum, and we gave it the name of Shipwrecks. Uh, mostly we do blended whiskies because our whiskey is quite young. So we do tonight's exercise to blend something together, and the sum of the parts is greater than. The other way around, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts generally. So we can take four or five nice whiskies like you've got in front of you and we can turn them into something that's better, or we hope. You can tell me if I'm wrong tonight. <laughs> uh, we do occasionally release single cast whiskies with a gold label. Uh, we charge like a wounded bull for those and they're not very common. We do about one a year and they tend to sell out very quickly. We've won a few gold medals. We've won some World Whiskey Awards. I picked up a a Whiskey Icons Award the other year for Best Distillery Manager, I think. I'm not quite sure how I managed that, but uh, since previous winners have been people like John Rochford, I'm not too concerned. Um, yeah, what else do you want to know? Oh, no, that's about it, you know. Remember, we're, we're recording this, so you, you want to, you know, people in 100 years in, in the future, they want to get, I want to know about where you were. This is now a historical <laughs> artefact. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're all self-taught as well. We taught ourselves along the way by asking a lot of questions and talking to other distillery operators, Bill Lark originally. So it's just a big learning curve. If you like whiskey, just ask questions. And, you know, yeah. that's really about it. We started out with Vic and me leaning on the school fence waiting to pick up the kids, curving on the yummy mummies. And, uh, they were younger back then. They were younger. <laughs> Young, yummy grandmas now. Uh, and Vic said he had been delivering mail to a homebrew shop and he'd seen a still for sale and he wanted to buy a still to make some vodka and I had a still at home so I said don't bother buying one, I've got one I inherited from my father, bring your booze around and we'll, we'll distill it and we just never looked back one day my wife said to me I was getting too old, too fat and too decrepit to do what I used to do for a living which was make flag poles and she said why don't you do something more sedentary and I said like what? and she said I don't know, make whiskey and even now, she says it's the only thing she's never had to tell me to do twice. <laughs> oh, that's True story. Right. Mm. Yeah. Okay. We love to see it. Uh, quick g'day to everyone who's in the Zoom chat and uh, to Alex Darlenberg, who's jumping on the Facebook, uh, says g'day as well. Hello, Alex. Now, Alex. Um, yeah. um, I think it's, <clears throat> it's now officially 10 past uh, seven. And one of the things about these virtual tastings is when we're – you know, in that previous life when we were able to run physical tastings with everyone in the tasting room there, if I got too long without allowing people to have a drink, they started throwing things at me. So this is about the time that would start happening. So I think um, Ian, and, Ian and Vic, you, you said we should probably go through the uh, what we're trying to recreate, batch, batch 19 first. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, um, you guys who are playing along at home, you've got uh, your six whiskeys there. Uh, the smallest one. Where the, the uh, 50 mil is uh, batch 19. Now, remembering if we were um, doing a tasting out the back here, we would have poured you 15 mil samples. Uh, so that's <laughs> less than half, like, a, you know, basically a quarter of this. Um, yes, if that. So, um, yeah, you don't need to finish it all at once. It's good to have a little bit to go back and, uh, and come back. And uh, so, so what can you tell me about batch 19? without telling me what's in it. <laughs> well, I can tell you we use somewhere between one and five of the samples. Don't use it all, whatever you do, because you can't come back later in the evening and compare your brew with our brew to see how close you are. So only use a little bit. I can read you our tasting notes, but it probably won't help. 
No, I think I think you know this is part of the thing as well, and and part of the challenge. I guess there's two elements to this. <clears throat> you know what we're doing tonight. There's the the blending side, but also the the trying things relatively blind side, and, and blind tasting is a bit of a a skill in itself. So I guess you know what I would encourage everyone to do is maybe just jot down some notes. They don't need to be hardcore tasting notes, but you know, is it dry? Is it sweet? Is it spicy? Like, look for key things. Is it oily? Does it get in on the, on the front of the tongue? Does it, you know, stick around in the throat? All those descriptors and, and feelings and, you know, uh, you know, expressions, because that's going to have to come from the five things in front of you. So, uh, and often I find that the writing down the first thing um, that comes into your mind is often the best. You can talk your way out of things. So, mm. well, that's right. I mean, you can also look at, you can eliminate things. Say, for example, if you try batch 19 and you, you and it's got a long finish, obviously as one of the blends, if, if it's blend is a short finish, you realize, well, that's not entirely going to work. So you look for the blend, you know, the whiskies that have got long finishes to try and make the um, combination. Another good hint is that our whiskies don't really work until they get to 21 or 22 degrees. So if yeah, you're warm, cold, up. warm it up. Yeah, okay. It's uh it's definitely iniquity though. <laughs> it's got that sort of, you know, big, you know, whiny, whether that's fortified or not, that big whiny drive to it. Um, it's but it's not like um I always find it like iniquity to be quite in industrial. Like it's a it's got grit, it's got, you know, power to it. It's not just like a you know, I, uh, this is a whiskey that I love, but you know, the Starwood Twofold, which is all sweetness forward and like silkiness. You know, Iniquity carries a lot more breadth on the palate, and, and this certainly does on the nose. Um, Andy, are you getting anything? I'm going to steal your notes. <laughs> so, Scott, when you say industrial, you mean it's got grunt, you don't mean it's earthy and dirty and gritty. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. More, yeah, more, more grunt and, and oomph. Like, uh, you know, if we were talking in Scottish terms, you know, a, a Ben Nevis or a Springbank or something that's got a little bit of, you know, grunt and dirtiness to it. Not that you accidentally, you know, dropped a bit of metal shavings into the, the still on the way past. Interesting. Oh, Glad you clarified that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but Andy, what, what, are you, what are you sort of pulling out there? Yeah. <clears throat> you can get definitely some wine notes. I don't know whether that's, there's sort of elements of red in there, but there's also this sweetness and whether that's coming from sherry or if it's, uh, you know, Tokai or... Um, sort of a sweet wine cask in there. Um, or something, a really nice sweetness that comes through. Um, really dry. Like there's, it feels like there's more French oak than American. Yep. I don't know if I'm just playing at words at the moment, but <clears throat> yeah, there's a really nice dryness to it. This is definitely, feels kind of <clears throat> that wine barrel character that's sort of making it a nice kind of clean cut finish. Yeah. yeah, so interesting point that Andy just pointed up there. They're actually going to go through, um, as well as talking what was in the barrel previously, but whether that was American oak or French oak or Hungarian oak or Russian oak or whatever it is, we're actually going to tell you with each cast what was in it previously and what type of oak it is. So um, probably when we get to, you know, the blending time, we might talk about the difference in what American yeah. and French oak will actually do to a whiskey. Um, but uh, for, for anyone um, who's, who's on the chat, I know this might be a little bit of a, we might not get as many tasting notes early. You know, <laughs> everyone's want to hold things to themselves. So this could be quite an interesting one, but feel free to, to throw any comments with it on whatever platform you're, you're watching on. And a quick g'day to David and or Caroline Taylor as well on the Facebook there saying g'day um, to having a bit of fun. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's the one thing I find about the iniquity batches, and this is certainly true of 19, is there's a DNA there's a house, you know, common thread, but they evolve. They're slightly different, you know. Mm. Um, other ones have been heavily peated. I'm not getting any peat on this no. um, at all. So I don't know if there's any peat in any of the casts we're going to go through, but... It's, it really opens up the time as well. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe that's a, a thing if you've got your little sample, maybe just leave the cap off um, yeah. for this first half an hour. <clears throat> So should we move on to now a, a one of our single casts? So everything as well uh, tonight is, is down at 46% to make it easy um, when we work it out. Um, and uh, because we're virtual, I can't see what you're all doing at home. Um, 
But if you are skipping ahead, that's totally fine. But just remember, if you when you start to blend, whenever that is, make sure you write down what you're doing and be precise because we're going to ask you for those precise measurements a little bit later on. Um, Vic, Ian, what what cask should we uh, should we look at? Well, let's look at 108 because it's the smallest number we used. Now, 108 uh, is a French oak Shiraz barrel from memory, but Previously, the spirit that's in there was in uh, port barrels, American oak. Uh, the spirit that's in there, I think, is four years old. So it's got a bit of a mixed history, having been both American oak and French oak, port and Shiraz. We find Shiraz tends to give very strong um, tannin notes, uh, which is something that is not that desirable. Um, we do like it. In moderation. It works as a blend. Marginal tannins. Um. We see, obviously, we see a lot of tannin in, um, you know, South Australian Shiraz, not so much from the hills, but from McLaren Vale and Barossa. Is it the oak or is it the, the tannin in the Shiraz getting into the oak? Both. Both. Okay. Yep. We tend not to leave our spirit in Shiraz barrels more than one summer as a first fill because they get a bit astringent towards the end of the second summer. And astringency is something that Vic and I aren't particularly keen on. Uh, we don't think our customers like it either. It's not not very nice, no. So barrel 108 by itself is a pretty nice drink, just quietly. And, um, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> it's a good whiskey on its own. The different oaks. And this is the curveball. Batch 19 could be a single cask. It could be. Nosing this one, I don't think it's this particular single cask, but potentially it could be. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly it's got that, you know, I think as Vic, you might have uh, alluded to there, you're saying it's quite good blend because you, you get that dryness, you know, mm. even on the nose. That's that Barossa Shiraz. Yeah. When you buy Shiraz casks, whether you're buying two or three or 500, do you... Like, do you know which wineries it's come from, or do you just buy? We have gone to the wineries and bought them directly from the wineries, so we do know where they come from in most cases. Uh, um, the last batch we bought, the end was, uh, they were roughly 10 years old when they had wine in them for 10 years. Yeah, eight to 10 years. We bought Shiraz cast from Shadow Tanunda and from Primo Estate. Mm. Uh, Primo Estate, because the owner used to live down the street from me, uh, and Shadow Tanunda, because they had a bunch of them at a good price. They are cheap, but you've got to be careful with them. And uh, if you spend too long in a Shiraz barrel, you bugger it, frankly. We found, on the other hand, Chardonnay barrels, Champagne barrels, Pinot barrels, Merlot barrels are much kinder on the spirit. So we probably won't be do getting many more Shiraz barrels. Probably none, actually. No. Um, just had a question here through using the, the Q&A function on the... Um uh, on, on the Zoom chat here, asking what format uh, are we going to want the the blending recipes in uh, a little bit later on, which is a very good question. So we're actually going to work them out based on 100 mil mixes. So out of the 100 mils, you know, cask 108 is X amount of mils and so forth, so on and so forth. If after six drams your mass skills aren't working particularly well, <laughs> don't worry, just make sure you've got the exact mils written down of what you put into it and we can just figure that out at our end. Write it down. Yeah, just yeah, just if in doubt, write it down. It's the it's the key. Um, I, found that, yeah. I found that when I'm doing blending, sometimes I've I've really got to write it down because, uh, and I've got to write on on the bottle or the glass. Otherwise, you come back to it after a few drinks. You think, what am I doing here? Actually, Vic's got to write everything down. I do. <laughs> Typically, I send him out to the barrel house and say, "Okay, come back with some stuff to make up the next blend of whiskey." You disappear for an hour and come back with half a dozen or a dozen samples and he'll play with them and throw them together and say, what do you think of that? And I say, I think it's shit, start again. Um, and I had to do that 40 times once. I forget which one it was. But oh, it was, was 40 different iterations before we found something we'd like. Uh, and then we take it home because it tastes different at home than it does in the factory. If you're in the distillery, you get so many smells and aromas from, uh, from the different barrels, the different spirits that still might be running. And then there's aromas coming in from outside because we're in an industrial area on the wrong side of town. It's not really that 
ideally, it's not what the Scots would consider an ideal environment for making whisky. So we take it home and we have a little taste at home and then we have a, a special panel of mates who are, have palates that we respect and we get them in and get their opinions before we get carried away. So there's a lot of thought and examination and analysis goes into every batch. And we thought this batch 19 was okay. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting, I mean, if, if we didn't have the 19 here and we were just sort of like trying to create something that was good, you know, That's that it. was the best of what we could create because we're all in so many different environments, you know, we're in the warehouse, you guys are at home, <coughs> people are sitting in boardrooms or at each other's mate's house, you might be sitting in the kitchen. It's, it's completely different. It actually reminds me of back in my previous life in the music industry, certain um, label heads and managers, when they were looking at new artists, would have to listen to the music in the car was the way that they could figure it out. You know, if they, they the only way they truly listened to music was in the car. So they would go into the car park on their lunch breaks and just sit and eat their lunch and listen to music in the car, which I think is is similar to, you know, to what everyone's doing at home now is just, you know, relax, find your sweet mm -hmm. spot. Um, you know, and also this is, there is, there are prizes, but this is fun as well. So don't take it too overly seriously. Because well, I'm sure you're all going to be better at, at it than I am. We've, I've never put together a blend in the factory. It just doesn't warrant it. So the more comfortable the surroundings, the better the whiskey tastes and the more uh, you can differentiate in comfortable surroundings. So that's important. I've always taken them home and worked them, worked on them from home uh, and then brought them back. And we, we go across, we've tried uh, many different, you know, uh, we've gone three or four different people, groups of people, three or four times over a couple of weeks to get uh, results back to make sure we're on the ball. Now, another peculiar thing about our whiskies is they change a lot over time. Yeah, they do, don't they? Just before we came on, I was reading my official tasting notes and I could not identify any of those characteristics in my glass I had in my hand. Not one. <laughs> yeah. So much for tasting notes. When I'm evaluating uh, sort of like single casks or, you know, particularly from overseas distilleries for, to bottle for the oak barrel, I'll always put a, a glass in the fridge um, before I try the sample and then try it in the cold glass. So essentially what it would feel like with ice without being watered down. And as it warms up at room temperature and then quite warm, because you never know where someone buys a bottle of whiskey from the oak barrel, where they're going to drink it. Are they going to, drink it on the sidewalk out the front, please don't do that. Are they going to drink it, you know, up in Queensland? Are they going to drink it, you know, in their basement, in their bathroom? So, yeah, it's a really interesting concept. Um, anyway, we should move on to cask 109, I think. Well, what did you think of 108? Did you like it? I did, yes. Yeah. So definitely, I uh, like the lots of tan and the dryness. Mm. I think the finish was a little bit shorter than what I found on batch 19. So there's certainly elements there. My early gut says there's a bit of 108 in it. Um, but as a base, I wouldn't say it's the dominant card. It's not dominant, no. No, there's definitely characters. There was that buttery finish that kind of softened out at the end, which I thought was really nice. Um, right. Yeah. So we to 109? Elements, but not. Yeah. Not the whole pack. All righty. So should we look at 109 then? Yep. 109 is pretty similar to 108. It's another Shiraz cast. One of them's heavily charred and one of them's not. I forget which one. Um, it's once again a, a couple of smaller casts that were dumped into a wine cast for a summer. The previous casts were American oak and I think port. I did look it up earlier. What is it? Yeah, I think it's port. Yeah, port and um, sherry once again. So there's a bit of both in this one. Yeah. So, yeah, so just to clarify, um, on, on 108 and 109, both um, – <clears throat> uh, French oak Shiraz cast, but have been filled from other casts in, in the warehouse. So um, it is a single cast sample because it's come from one cast, but the whiskey that's in here hasn't spent its entire life in there, which does make things uh, nice and difficult. So thank you to, to you guys for doing that. So um, as well as knowing the, the makeup of the cast, um, again, trust the instincts of what you get out of the glass, not necessarily what it says on the, on the, um, on the, on the it's also why we haven't really posted the details of each cask because we want you to sort of appreciate them for what they are rather than what yeah. you might think they what a French oak Shiraz cask should taste like. All right, so for me, immediately softer on the nose. 
Is the the wine the wine that was in this was it older by any chance? Um, that I can't tell you. <clears throat> no, we don't know the history of the cask. Well, we know it was Shiraz. We know it was Primo Estate. And probably we uh, used the cask for about eight or nine years. But we don't know what was it, that particular one was in it. Was it a shorter time in this cask versus because that is it's noticeably softer. <clears throat> It uh, could be, well, but when a winery uses their cast, they don't use, you know, they use it for, say, six or eight years, but the wine doesn't spend six or eight years in the cast. They might have mm. filled it three times or four times, and they might have even started out and chewing uh, white wine in it for three or four months. Mm. All we know is it had Shiraz in it last time they emptied it. I think, um, and this just goes to, explain the extent of my uselessness at uh, <clears throat> writing and dealing with tasting notes. So I'm going to call this wetter than the other cask as well, because it's not quite as dry. Uh, I don't know what a wetter whiskey means, but uh, that's something that popped into my head. You should probably um, have enough already. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so another example that if you were like trying to steal all the tasting notes, don't steal that one because I have no idea what I'm doing. I may be the one on screen. I'm definitely not the expert. Um. It does have more of that sort of burnt caramel though, which I did pick up in in. Um, so that may be a giveaway that it's actually a, uh, a charred cask. Okay, so again, this one might be the, the more heavily charred yeah. of the two. Heavy charred, you'd have a bit more caramel, and you wouldn't have the long wine type of flavour coming through. That shortens a little bit. You know, the tannins shorten when, when, when the cask is charred. In answer to your question, Andy, as far as um, Shiraz casks go, <clears throat> most wineries would put their <clears throat> Shiraz in a cask, in a new cask for one to two years and sell it as a premium. And then they might put something else in there for, for three or four years and sell it as a medium range sort of wine. And then they'll finish off with something that's a bit cheaper for the last three years. <clears throat> so Typically, when wine way. casks are done and dusted, they sell them to people who put fortifieds in. Um, so we've skipped out the fortified part of this instance. So, you know, Ian, those uh, port casks that we use, they originally had red wine in them yeah. because apparently they don't put port into uh, new wine casks. I thought I just said that. I yeah. thought you just said that. Well <laughs> <laughs> <Hot> spotted. <laughs> I think that the best thing about tonight is that I, I think in the initial um, iteration of what we were going to do, we were only going to get one of you up here Um just with the costs of flights and everything, it didn't make a huge amount of sense. But I'm liking the idea that we get a little bit of a look into the dynamics of a day at the Tin Shed Distillery <laughs> at the moment. Yep, it's always entertaining. Um, you got to remember, Vic is a postman, but his real trade is chef. And that's why he gets the job of working at the Brent's because he's got the palate for it. He's actually pretty good, if I say so myself. Thank you. That's um, the last compliment you get from me, though. Yeah, I better write that down, otherwise I'll forget. <laughs> you won't. You remember that forever. Hey, on the what's the date today? The first <laughs> halfway. We're calling it officially <clears throat> halfway. Yeah. Um, just while we on this one, and um, I think we we'll move on to the next one in a second. But what is it about like a cast like the five that we're trying that you go, okay, it's ready. I, I like this a lot, but then. Also, this can work in a blend. Like, what sort of things are you looking for in, in a single cask that, you know, for, for a blend? Is it just, okay, it's hit a certain maturity or are there specific flavours you go, okay, that could work if we do something to it? Well, you've got to tick uh, uh, all the things that you're looking for in a whiskey. So it has to be uh, a fairly long finish. It's got to be rounded. It can't be hot. You can't actually uh, blend a spirit that's hot and expect it not to be hot, even if you've got three other, three other whiskies in it. So you've got to tick the things that you like in a whiskey uh, to make a blend. So um, if something is untowards or, or not quite right, or if it's astringent, well, that's put aside to mature for a little bit longer. Um, now, 108, 109 being um, September 2016, they're almost four years old. Some of the old ones, uh, they're, they're good for, uh, for the full roundness of the flavors because they're a little bit older. Um, so then you might get something like 120, which we haven't come across yet, but we will. Um, it's more of a, let's say, a beige type of whiskey where it's, it really doesn't assume anything, but it could extend 
the really nice flavours of 108 or 109 um, without disrupting it too much. So you're looking at something with flavour, something not so much flavour, um, a wine finish. You don't want too many wine finishes coming in, so you, you need some sherry or, or port to disrupt that. Uh, it's Yeah, it's quite complex. And, and sometimes what you think works, you put it together, it doesn't. They come across with, come out with something really uh, quite different. Yeah. And as for single barrel, if it's uh, when you try a single barrel, it's worth bottling as a single barrel. It just says, wow. You pull the yeah. boat, you have a smell, and you have a drink, and you go, wow. It's just. It's like you're saying, Scott, first impression. Sometimes your first impression, you go with your first impression, you think, wow, that's really good. And it is. Um, so you put that one aside for, for a, not, a, not a blend, but a single release, single cask release. Yeah, excellent. Well, let's let's move on to that that cast that you mentioned there, cast one hundred and twenty. Um, so, what's what's in this one? Or what what was the cast from? That's the first Phil McWilliam Sherry from SA Cooperage. It's two hundred and twenty-five liters. In fact, all these barrels are two two fives. They're briefs. Uh, it's American oak, and it's a very pleasant, unbeige whiskey. But there's nothing really exceptional about it. Uh, yeah, it's, it's nice, but not good enough to be a single barrel. Well, it's probably a bit young for that. It could be a single barrel in maybe another couple of years, um, depending on how much we've got left. Have we got any left of that? Vic, you just told me you used something silly, mate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did that slip out? Yeah. <laughs> That's the um, first hint of the night. I, I like this. Can we... Can we... Can't maybe like Uber eats a few more drinks to Vic because he might be a little bit looser by the time we <laughs> a few more hints. He's got a cupboard for me, he doesn't need help from here. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're moving away not only from Shiraz, but we're going from two French oak to two American oaks. Um, so from two American uh, French oaks into an American oak cask, immediately, you know, a completely different whiskey to the first two, which had quite a few similarities to them. Um, more vanilla, more honey. Nowhere near the the tannin structure of the first two. No, it's it's it's, it's approachable on the nose alone. You know, it's it's got that kind of soft, delicate sort of texture that you can, without even trying it, you, you're drawn in. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's very um, yeah yeah that's a good. What's what's a technical term for being drawn in? <laughs> oh, so <laughs> sucked in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think Raf's come up uh, on the Zoom chat with, uh, he, he posted Yummo, then he posted Yummo again. So you've got double Yummo for this one, apparently. <laughs> so yummo. Is yeah. Yummo for barrel 120 or 108 or 109? Uh, one, 120, I'd assume. Yeah. 120, 120. Thanks, Yummo. Uh, Raf, sorry. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's, it's a good point. I mean, you know, the, the way that Iniquity, you've set yourself up for your releases is quite different to a lot of the other Australian distilleries who will either go single casks only or, you know, maybe two casks or do the Solera thing. But, you know, if you've used, you know, three or four of these casks we're going to try tonight, there's still going to be things left in that barrel, which is what you were saying about casks 108 and 109. Mm. It's leftovers from things being used in other blends. So it's almost like this <clears throat> continual evolution of, of the spirit. So, um, yeah, I like that point that Vic, you know, you I don't know how much is left. I don't know how, how much went into the blend, but you know, it could be a gold label single casks down the down the track if there's. Well, it's you know. very possible. We, we have had a, a sherry cask that's been recoupered uh, by SA Cooperage and recharred. Uh, generally, blend you know will, will work itself into a really really good whiskey. But sherry seems to take uh, probably an, a year slower to mature than a pork cask. I think uh, because sherry is just a, lot, a little bit spicy. Mm -hmm. A little bit peppery. Um, it just seems to, to work a little bit slower. Did you find that in as well? Yep, I do. Cast of mine back to Southern Coast days, I remember Jim Murray's Bible. Uh, we did a 96 and a bit point whiskey with Jim Murray, and he said he was on bended knee in, in awe. And that particular barrel was a French oak, American oak, port or sherry, I can't remember which. That was poured. I was port. moving it one day and the hoops fell off. And we started to lose spirit everywhere. So we quickly jammed the hoops back on and found another barrel to put it into. And that particular barrel, particular batch was a single cask bottling, but it had spent time in two casks because the cask fell apart. 
And we learned from that that don't be afraid to shift the booths from barrel to barrel. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Often one barrel imparts something, but you need a bit extra to make it a really nice batch of whiskey. So we stick it another barrel or mix another barrel with it to get that little extra. Yeah, well, we're always going for that because we don't we don't have time on our side. Um, you know, you could probably get the same results after six or seven or eight years, but we're talking about top notch whiskies after three or four years. Yeah, I um I see your where your initial comments came from on that um on that cask. The the like the nose had a lot going on, and maybe because it was quite a stark difference to 108, 109. And the palate was good, but it wasn't like necessarily grabbing me. Yeah. But the notes I wrote down there that that I think there actually might be, I mean, I've forgotten what 19 tastes like, so I'm gonna to have to go back, but that's <laughs> quite a good base to build upon where you've got like that quite soft and vanilla, exactly. yeah. you know, nothing too spicy or tannic that's gonna take away from other flavors, but it's a good base to sort of build upon. So I think that's gonna be, I mean, you know, two, my first blend are gonna probably start with 120 and go from there in some way, shape or form. If I was offering advice, I'd probably offer exactly that. I'd say you got the makings of a brilliant blender, Scott. <laughs> um, just, just so I, uh, just so we're all clear here, I am, I, I definitely haven't shared. I haven't even these cars have been all these little bottles been sitting here for two or three weeks now. I haven't opened any of them. I haven't noticed any of them uh, nice. until until today. No, honestly, I haven't had the time. <laughs> so. But uh, but yeah. All right. So one thirty four. Uh, what what do we got there? One thirty four. Oh shit! Hang on, I've got to look it up. I reckon that cherry. Have I got that right? One thirty four uh, yeah. is American oak sherry cask. Provided its first fill. It came from SA Cooperage, and I've got a note that says stratified stuff from SR seven. So although the barrel uh, was filled on uh, the twenty. 9th of the 12th, 2017, it had some of the stuff we put together and distilled in our very early days. So there's probably six-year-old spirit in there. Yeah, okay, which is which is very, very old. I mean, to... Oh, for us, yeah. Yeah, for, for you guys, what sort of evaporation loss are you looking at annually? <clears throat> it varies from cast to cast, but uh, in the worst-case scenario, 15%. The best-case scenario, about 7 or 8. Average is about 10 or 11 yeah, okay. First year is the worst year. So that uh, iniquity 10-year-old is going to be quite expensive because there's going to be about 30 mils of it left. Something like that. <laughs> we had 47-degree days last summer and we had zero-degree nights this week or last week. So there's quite a temperature range. But I actually think the humidity contributes just as much as the temperature change. I think so. I think we'll lose uh, we'll lose four percent into a hundred litre cast, don't we? Just the wood absorption. Yeah, that's right. Four that or five percent just gets sucked up into the wood. So four litres goes into the wood when we fill a hundred litre cask. That stays there. Luckily, uh, quick, uh, it doesn't have to get sucked up again for a second fill. A uh, quick question before I dive into this one from um, uh, Whiskey is my jam, who might be a dark horse tonight because I believe they've picked up some prizes. From some of the other virtual tastings we've done um, okay. in the last past month, so that's mm -hmm. if, you, if you're a betting man, if you're on you know the old sports bet, that'd be a one to watch. Coming <laughs> in at quite short odds at the moment, um, but I think the question is, uh, what ABV are you filling your casks at? Years ago, we filled at sixty three and a half because that's what everyone else did. That's what the Scots did, and we didn't know any better. Uh, then we started filling at sixty up until just this month, and we started filling at fifty seven. And the reason we do that is two or threefold. Um, some American distillers told me we should be filling at 55, much faster maturation, they said. Uh, Starwood's doing it at 55 or 57, and we talked to those lads sometimes, and they got some advice from Diageo that in our club we should be doing it at a lower percentage. Uh, we also started doing it at a lower percentage at 60 because we found that after a couple of years we'd go and look at a barrel and in the low to mid 70s, even higher, uh, because of the evaporation. The water molecules inside the barrel look outside, I think it's hot, sunny, and dry. I want to go out, put the sunshade, put the shades on, and you know, go for a bit of a wander in the sun. 
Whereas in Scotland, the water molecules look outside and say, bugger you, it's wetter outside than in. Um, so we would we were bottling, sorry, we were filling a lower strength anyway, just because we didn't want to have to go around and top them up again with water because they get in too strong. And if they get too strong, um, I don't know if you've ever tasted that stuff with Kim Duck, it's, it's pretty unapproachable at really high strength. It can pull astringency you don't want to see in a whiskey. And Tim yeah. gets astringency in his whiskies and does all sorts of weird things to get rid of it. We just don't put it there in the first place if we can avoid it. So we probably taste every barrel every year, wouldn't you say, Vic? Uh, at least. If they're, if they're good, we taste them many times a year. Um, <laughs> The bad ones we don't taste all that often, or the young ones we just we know that you know tasting anything under a year is really a waste of time, uh, unless it's something specifically uh, that we're looking for. Uh, we didn't get desperate either. We can we've got enough whiskey now. We can drink all the stuff. Well, Ian, Ian did fill a barrel at forty eight percent, which is one of our most heavily peated ones. It's a bit of an experiment, uh, which actually is quite amazing. It's only a year old. It was, it was filled in at forty eight percent. It's a fifty now, isn't it? It's gone up uh, about that, that, we're going to bring that out in the new year. It's going to be called the Fluster Club. Um, and the reason is Vic was asked to water it down. And he thought I meant water it down so we could do a triple distillation. And he ran out of water or something and didn't oh, talk about it. Yeah, and I ran it down. I thought he watered it down to 60 to put it in the barrel. So I just put it in the barrel. And then a few days later, for some reason, I checked it and discovered it was 48.8. Hence, we call it the Fluster Club. <laughs> but it's really, really nice, and it's uh, it's actually smoked with uh, Mally smoke. That one is, yeah. Mm. Very good. A um, couple of comments coming through that uh, complimenting the nose on one three four. Mm. A lot more dark fruits <clears> for me. <throat> baking spice after a bit of air, like quite an intense, like almost confectionery sweetness mm. on, on the nose. There's really a nuttiness to it. Like I don't, is it roasted almonds or it's something it's a cooked nut but there's there's that really nice kind of nutty texture to it the palette's not as broad as some of the others um i feel like this is quite front forward i think like the nose is the star on one three four yeah yeah that's a good point but in terms, if you think about it as a blend, what it would do, you've got, you know, the first two casks, you've got some very dry casks. And so, you know, that, you know, cask 120, that will soften everything out and give it that sort of richness and, and depth. And maybe this is the one where you're getting all in on the nose and it's probably helping balance that dry character that you'll get from the French oak. Yeah. You're getting ahead. Anything's possible. <laughs> Thomas Sutton uh, throws marzipan in there as well <clears throat> yeah. as a flavor profile, which I completely agree with. When when you're blending in general, what's are you blending in cask strength? Are you bringing it down to? Uh, no, I just, I just, well, ideally, if you wanted to look for any imperfections, you've got to take it down to 23% uh, to, to identify that, but I don't do that because it just, it's not right. I mean, my, most of the people drink it at 46, so I do blend it at 46. Um, and also, if we do have a release at, say, we have gold, we've we've got to try that at 60 percent. So, um, and if it's good at 60, it's, some whiskies are good at a higher strength. I mean, um, I watered down the cluster. What's a fluster cluck? <laughs> um, I put a bit of water that into that to about 42 percent. It just was no good. But at fifty percent, it was it was brilliant. So I kept it all together. The high spirit keeps the flavors uh, tight, and if you add water, it opens them up. So you don't really want too much opening up. No, but in answer to your question, four to six percent generally for blending, uh, unless it's something that we're looking for uh, at a higher or lower percentage. If you talk to someone from the edge, you know, they go through every barrel at twenty three percent or thereabouts, and look for faults and flaws. Um, but it tastes like shit. It all tastes like shit at 23%. So we don't do it. You don't get drunk <laughs> drinking it at 23%. Well, you can, but you don't. It doesn't taste good. Sounds like hard work. Mm. It's, fun. it's fun work. Yeah. And 
why do you think I have this job is to potentially do, like, <laughs> never do hard work in my life? So the, lo- the longer you blend whiskey, the more fun you have because by the end of the night. <laughs> Maybe, all, maybe that's why each each batch of iniquity should have like a how long it took to to blend like whether it's an hour <laughs> done that's going to be great if it took like seven weeks uh like it was oh, okay that might be god knows what they were thinking by the end of that one <laughs> all right so you're up to number 150 150 now let's have a look and see what sort of barrel that was uh one oh, shit. I haven't got the notes. Have you got the notes? Do you know what that is? Uh, that's uh, here. It's a, it's a Shiraz. Yeah, this, this was the same as 108, 109, wasn't it? Yeah, I think 150 is a Shiraz cask as well. You reckon it's Shiraz? I thought it might have been Chardonnay, actually. Have you got the notes? It's, it's certainly wine of some sort, I think. The, the tannins from the first two have sort of come back all of a sudden. Well, that would be a Shiraz cask. Or at least like that. Um... Well, I've got French oak. So French oak is usually a wine cask. Generally speaking, we, we've only got a few Chardonnay and Pinot pre-cast, so most of them are Shiraz. If it does have that winey finish, it's a little bit like 108, 109. Like I said, Scott, it, it would be a Shiraz cask. It's almost like a um, not 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 sure, but but like like you know that almost remember that popping candy stuff, that horrible American candy shit that somehow made its way to America. <laughs> yeah. Like just the nose of that, like the after effect of that. Why why is that fun sort of thing on the nose? It's like it's it's a tannin, but it's not you know forty year old scotch that's been in there too long and it's not, you know, red wine driving tannin. Yeah. Just, there's something in that spice there. I think it's a white wine. You think it's white? Yeah. Okay. The, you, Vic, Vic's pretty sure it's Shiraz, but you can go white wine if you want. Yeah. It's a very different character to it. One one thing I haven't asked about um because I know different whiskies are going into different cars and that sort of thing is um and because I Thing we should take things on their merits and their flavor profile is is the age um cask 150 is obviously filled after other casks can we assume that this is younger than cask 108 109 you can uh, yes it's filled at 62.8 percent on the 20th of march 2018. okay so just quite young just just whiskey mm. just 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 whiskey in a 200 liter cask yeah which is Possibly one of the reasons you think it tastes a bit weird. Yeah, okay. And particularly because the 108, 109 had some not only filled then, but stuff that was filled previous to that. So that, that's considerably older, probably double in a bit in most cases. Mm. And more complex as a result, too. Yeah. But I can see from a blending point of view how this could maybe give a bit of zest, a bit of get up and go yeah. in small doses. You quite often that, that kind of young. <clears throat> young whiskey just <clears throat> bursts that flavour into the, you know, you 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 need that older older liquid to balance the the complexity. Yeah. But it's um, great to kind of just pop pop that flavour right in. I think it's a great shame that COVID came along. We didn't get to do the original concept at your place, Scott, because you would have really enjoyed that. Yeah, well, look, you know, this this is actually quite a really good value for money. Uh, events given what we're doing but uh, i have um no issues with uh maybe rolling it out in february again this version we're doing now is a lot harder yeah and i, I think that's that's the point because if if you and now we've tried these five casts if you want to just create the best whiskey you can possibly create the rules are endless you know True. whereas now we're, we're sort of fixed in we're gonna it's gonna be very difficult i was actually thinking just before how the hell we're going to judge this uh because no one's going to get it get it to the millimetre perfect, right? I wouldn't be but, surprised if it happens. Yeah, well, yeah, it, it might. But then what if someone gets it almost perfect but includes a cask that's not in it? Or if someone gets it millimetre <clears throat> perfect but doesn't include the two mils of a cask that is in it? So I haven't actually thought that far through uh, on how I'm going to judge this one. But um, this is um, 
Yeah, I don't, actually, quick question from Jordan. Um, who says, we're very happy that the original concept didn't work because now they can play in from Melbourne. Um, and yeah, I think we're actually sending, we sent some to Tassie, Melbourne. Uh, there's a couple went out to Dubbo as okay. well, out yeah. there, Queensland as well. So it's good. In fact, I think some went back to South Australia as well, funnily enough. Someone's yeah. double dipping. Maybe they didn't win the first time. <laughs> okay. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I guess now, um, Everyone, you can use whatever you've got at home, but um, we, we sent out uh, pipettes with, with the packs as well. Now is the time that you can start blending and, and creating. Uh, and yes, Dubbo's online, beautiful, great to see. Go to the establishment bar, drink the whiskey and be happy. So now's probably a good time to go back to 19. Give it a bit of a smell, give it a bit of a taste. Um, see, see what's happening there. I, I think my guts would be start with a a reasonable base of 120 and i again i don't know whether it's right or not and then build from there is, is what i would do on this one um so i think we we might uh, talk a little bit of shit while people are putting things together and part of the fun here is maybe you know have a stab at 19 and i'm gonna uh, get everyone to email me and i'll post this in the zoom and on the facebook there their recipes and you can do that straight away you can do it in 10 minutes 20 minutes whatever um but once you have um, email me. Don't feel, uh, you know, I, I'd love to hear any other recipes from these makeups you might have as well. If you and I hope, I think I cracked 19, but this one's even better. <laughs> uh, I'll show those guys from South Australia what they're doing wrong. Yeah, we, we'd love to hear um, any other things as well. And that's quite possible as well. Yeah. <laughs> that, is, that is possible. Not going to happen though. <laughs> yeah. So um, now, yeah, like start to have a play. Um, so one of the things when you so when when you're blending whiskey, say you've you've got a, a warehouse full of casks, you've got twenty that you potentially can play with. Is it, you know, what like when you're blending, what are you looking for? Because you've already identified that these casks are are, are good. They're they're ready. They may not be perfect by themselves. Mm -hmm. Are you looking to create like is it a is it a three? I want nose. I want palate. I want finish. Is it as simple as that? Or like how do how do you sort of work for this? Uh -huh. one that yeah, you, you definitely look at age first. So you, you determine what you want to use uh, from the age point of view. Uh, knowing that uh, wine having a, a fairly strong sort of tannin uh, flavour and, and a sort of um, a long finish, you don't want to use that too much of that. So you want something that might temper or extend it like a um, American oak um, bourbon cask. So it's a matter of knowing your whiskies and what comes out of them uh, that determines the blend. Um, prior, prior to this, when we were Southern Coast Distillers, we used single 100-litre uh, casks, which were all recharred. So we based that on Bill Lark's um, whiskey, on the principles that he used 100-litre casks, with, which mature really quickly. So we always had a lot of different whiskies and uh, we were fairly small at that stage, so we were only doing single um, batch releases, which was quite simple. But since we've grown, we have to become uh, a little bit more... Uh, inventive, I suppose, especially because we don't have a lot of age and um, old whiskey on our, on our side. Um, some whiskies, even even so they're three or four years old, just aren't quite ready yet. Yeah. I'm um, just had a question here as well on the inner Zoom chat. I'm just about to post my email and everything. Um, we're talking about, so we want, we want your recipes in 100 mil, um, you, you know, sort of makeups. So yep. whiskey's my jam. Ask, do you want a percentage? Exactly. That's so. Yeah. Percentage or 100 mils, whether it's 50 mils of X, Y, Z, 30 mils of X, Y, Z, 10 and 10 of yep. you know, Y and Q. Um, if that maths eludes you, just write down what you filled, send it to me, and I'll figure it out from, from there. That's easy done. But I'm just going to put all of it in here. Uh, going forward in the future, we've filled a lot of bourbon casts in the last couple of years. Initially, we weren't big fans of bourbon casks because we were of that Tasmanian school. We had to fill everything into sherry or port, sorry, tawny or para casks. And that's what we always did because that seemed like a good idea and we liked the whiskies that came out of it. But one day I needed to fill some barrels and I didn't have any port barrels and I couldn't get them. I couldn't get any sherry. So I ordered a couple of bourbon barrels and filled those and put them in the back of the warehouse and forgot about them. Then walk past them two years later and I wondered what the hell they taste like and tried them and they were really nice. 
they disappeared in the blend we put out at Christmas time last year with the Whiskey Club. But we filled another couple of dozen bourbon casks. And the first of them should be coming of age at Christmas or January, Vic, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, not long after that, you'll see some bourbon casks released as opposed to sherry and port. And the difference is quite dramatic. Yeah, put them in the same category as sherry casks for uh, maturity. They, always, they take a little bit longer um, to mature than, say, a, a charred pork cask. While, uh, while people are playing around with this, um, you did touch on uh, a rum uh, at the very start of this uh, tasting, and I've tried a little bit of the rum uh, in, in previous years, particularly when I've been down in South Australia. Um, and I know that a lot of it was snapped up by other markets very first batches, but one thing that many people might not know about is the history of SS Ferret. Um, if you are a fan of, and you might not know SS Ferret either, mm -hmm. but you will know, you'll definitely know. Uh, and so Andy uh, now lives in Australia, he's working mm -hmm. with, with um, South Trade, but previously was essentially um, me at the Whiskey Exchange in London. So that means far more important, far better looking, and far, <laughs> loads a lot not more than, than I do. But um, you would obviously know Whiskey Galore, yes. the, the book, which is the, a story and then a movie um, about a ship sinking off a small Scottish island and all the locals going and grabbing all the uh, whiskey. Mm. So the SS Ferret in a short story was a boat that was nicked up from uh, Edinburgh while it was going towards the Mediterranean and named a whole bunch of different things until they picked it up in uh, Melbourne, but a long story short, it actually sunk um, off, off the coast coming into Adelaide, um, filled with beer, and all the locals got beer. So um, and we actually put, uh, in, in a bottling we did, of a Lefroy, put the SS Ferret on the front of that label, and then I saw the rum came up. So we're talking about the SS Ferret, uh, the same SS Ferret, I didn't know they had beer in it. That was new. Used yeah, to I, I think so, because I, I, I found the old... Um, uh, the old cutting of it, I'm pretty sure, uh, from the old newspaper. I thought I'd read everything there was published about it, but uh, the Estes Ferret was stolen in about 1883 or somewhere from Scotland and appeared six months later or some months later in, in Port Victoria, sorry, Port Melbourne, and it had the misfortune to sail through the heads or past the rip at Queenscliff there when there was a Scottish policeman on duty who happened to be reading an article sitting at the end of the wharf at Queenscliff, and the article was from a Scotsman newspaper describing how the ferret had been stolen, and they had a photo. And he looked up, and the ship sailed past as he looked up, and that was how they came unstuck. Yeah. That's interesting. It is a good story. I recommend you, you Google it on Wikipedia. It's a bit of a yarn. That's, it's excellent. I, I just I love the, uh, you know, when they, because it went to South Africa, I think, Yep, went to Rio, went to Cape Town. Yeah, went they're to rubbing off things and throwing bits of the boat off the front of it to make it look like it was, you know, sunk and ran, you know, ransacked. So they find the floating bits. But I think, yeah, found its way to Albany and then into Melbourne. Yeah. Where it was things. But um, uh, jo John Hitchin, um, I, I got your one through on the, the Q&A there, so I've, I've hidden that now for you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I have actually no idea. Uh, in fact... Maybe in about 10 or 15 minutes, maybe Ian, if you've got your computer there, can actually email me the, the makeup so that I can actually judge what's going on uh, and how this is. I, I, I'm actually, I'm going to recurse myself because I, yeah, I'm too busy talking, but I would, I, I would start with 20, 120. <clears throat> I'd probably throw a little bit of wisdom notes. I think there's a fair bit of 108 in it. Um, and I think 134. Personally, I'm not sure if I would throw 109. Although that burnt caramel note I did get on 19, so maybe maybe a touch, maybe a touch I'd throw there. A um, couple more comments coming through, uh, and regardless of if we get this right or wrong, Ref says uh, batch 19 is a lovely combination, so nicely done. Thanks, Ref. And maybe everyone's missed uh, the trick here, which is what I'm going to do is I'm going to send myself an email to say 100 mils of batch 19. <laughs> How's uh, Andy, the alchemist, going? Uh, there's there. a lot more notes than I have. Um, <laughs> I thought I was there and then I feel like I've fallen off a cliff. Yeah, you get that. You get palate <laughs> fatigue as well. 
you're you're using everything though. You're throwing everything at it. Uh, so yeah, same thing as same with a lot of 120, but with then varying ratios between you know five mils and 20 mils of um, the other. It's, it's not there. <laughs> it's the downside yeah. of doing it on a large pour as well. You're now now left with 40 mils. Yeah, yeah I think it's it's too sweet. I think um, I think there's more of the there's more tannin in 19. I think. I would almost look at reversing what you've done there with one, three, four, sorry, with, uh, yeah, maybe bring 150 down a bit and 108 up a bit would be my hint there. I love this. It's like being at a kid's birthday party and watching the kids, you know, trying to work out how to do something. Yeah, yeah. But, it, but it's good because it's actually a good learning curve to f work out what whiskies do to each other when they're mixed. And that's, and that's the thing, I mean, I, like, I'm going to mention the, the G word and I probably shouldn't, but um, you see a lot of gin tastings and masterclasses like this because individual botanicals distilled are so blatant what they are. Like orange peel distilled is orange and <clears throat> cardamom is, is that. So you can, it's actually a very honest and easy way. And if you've got a gin that doesn't do something, you throw more X, Y, Z at it. With whiskey, it's so difficult because they taste different, but they're, they're nowhere near as transparent as why they taste like that. And there's some no. um, botanicals in gin and some barrels in whiskey that might not be exceptional, but when you throw them together, actually bring it up. So I wonder if, you know, it'd be interesting to, you know, I've, I've said I would start on a one base of 120 to do it the other way, is build a, like a, a 40 or 50 mil base of the others and then drown it in 120 to see, try and bind them all together, whether that would make a difference. Mm. If we get to do this again, maybe we'll make it more challenging by providing the samples at cast strength and then give you some water as well. So you can do <laughs> this, this is hard enough, mate. This is hard that's, enough. That's, that would be the advanced class. Um, I did, did get a question here is what's the deadline for having the mix emailed to you? So we were umming and ahhing about this. Um, I, I think that, you know, we should probably provide a sense of finality. You know, it may be, you know, at 8.20, <laughs> at 8.30 to actually announce what it was because I think if we sent you all to bed without knowing I think that'd be a bit of a cock tease <laughs> so um yeah look I reckon if by let's say 8 20 um so that's 15 minutes give you know chuck it into on the email then I like I may actually have to get back to the winners tomorrow by the time I go through and work out who got the closest based on because there's a few variables here but um yeah and but you yeah, certainly um I, I think, and whenever I've done blind tastings, and I really am terrible at blind tastings, um, it's like the, the Scotch Malt Whiskey Champs, for example, you get about 45 minutes to go through nine whiskeys and try and guess what they are. After five minutes, I'm, I've noticed them and I go, okay, I think that's what they are. That's I should write it down and yeah. walk away because after half an hour later, I've double guessed, I've changed it all, and yeah, chances yeah. are my, I get zero out of nine <clears throat> rather than the two out of nine I would have got if I'd gone earlier. So, um, Certainly, yeah, it's it's fun. Don't ever think it. Uh, Peter Lawking's palate is absolutely stuffed now, uh, so he can't taste anything anymore. So well done, thanks for that. Uh, also, Scott, okay. if one of your boats uh, or girls submit their entry, they could give us their shirt size as well. Uh, yes, yeah. So <clears throat> we'll give them a but, bottle of whiskey and a t-shirt for winning if they're good enough. Yeah. Well, what, what, once once we figure out the winner, I might um go back and get that okay. details from them. Yep. And the thing is, you can mix, mix up your own batch 19 at the end of the night Yeah. what's left. Also, the only other way that you would ever get to just drink these single casts is potentially by going down to South Australia and, and Adelaide and getting out to the distillery. And there's still no guarantee that Ian's going to be in a good mood to actually let you try single <laughs> casts. So. I don't think there's much doubt about it. <laughs> but if anyone does come down, they've got to ring and make an appointment because technically we're not open to the public. Our license doesn't allow us to do that. So we can have our friends come around anytime. We just can't have the public come around. That makes sense. Well, I think we've got 18 times three friends in the room here. It's amazing how many friends I've got these days. <laughs> <laughs> My wife's absolutely amazed. What's Nazar said? 40 mils, 120. 20. Yeah, okay. So now, Nazar, you're not going to win on that. You, know email, you can now. just message me directly on the chat as well. That works. I am collating them all. Yeah, okay, so 
De definitely. What, what I might do is uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do it this way. Just get everyone to send in the things. But because there's so many variables, it might take half an hour to actually go through and find who got the closest. And they said someone nails it right on the head because there could be some give or take. Uh, and I think Raph's nailed the whole um, exercise on the head by saying he's just enjoying his blend. I don't think he's, he may have got anywhere near it, but that's, that's looking at it. Um, yeah, so that's coming through. Andy looks perplexed. Andy, what's going on? <laughs> You're perplexed. Yeah, that's exactly what's going on. I think yeah. perplexed is yeah. the He's lost. He's well, I would say in all fairness to Andy and everyone else, that it sometimes takes a couple of weeks for Vic to come up with a blend. And as I recall, it took him about five or six days to come up with this blend. Too. Well, I can't. After a while, you just you can't do any more. You have enough, so you got to leave it alone, uh, and you come back to it. Yeah. And you can't. You just can't drink every night. Other some nights you think oh, I really can't drink. I don't want to drink. I can't do it. And you know, you've got to be in the mood. It's really a mood thing. That's really weird, actually. I find with whiskey. The mood, the surroundings, uh, the frame of mind you're in, which is your mood, I suppose, it all makes a big difference. Even the atmospheric pressure, if it's cold and miserable outdoor day, you're better off with a smoky whiskey. If it's stinking hot in summer, you're better off with a block of ice and maybe see it an old fashioned or a whiskey sour. Mm. Definitely. So it is, yeah. If you want to, if you you can either message it to me on on Zoom, or if you're on the Facebook, send me a private message. Um, but otherwise, Scott S C O W T at oakbarrel.com.au. The same, basically the same email. If you're in the Zoom, the same email that you got the um, link to today. You can just reply to that email if you want. That came from me as well. Um, but yeah, this is incredibly difficult. If if I think that if anyone gets it, you know, within 10 mils, I'm going to have to buy them a bar voucher or something as well because this is <laughs> – it will be extraordinary if that happens. And if you come back to it too many times, you second-guess yourself all the time. So you, you've basically got to have a taste, remember what it is, try to remember out of those samples and then uh, do your best to put it all together. And if that doesn't work the first time, it's definitely not going to work the second time. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have a very quick stab. I'm going to go 10 mils of the 120. Working on a, a like a 20 mil thing. So this would be uh, times five. So essentially 50 mils of this in a 100 mil sample. Yep. I like the idea of uh, 108. I thought that had some of that tannin spice in there. So let's say... Um, let's go two mils of that. So what are we? Uh, good ten, morning, you're writing it down. Two, yeah, this is good idea because I was definitely, I, was, I know it's recorded, but I definitely will forget this. <laughs> I don't have to like watch it back to figure out what it is. I actually might uh, yeah, go four mils of that. No, no, three. Don't be an idiot, Scott. What are you talking about? Definitely go three. Uh, that'll do that. Uh, one three four, just a dash. I think I don't think it had a dash. I I thought it there's that fruit that comes through from this. That's See, I I upweighted it more the more I tried it. I feel like it actually it's it's a secret sort of it's a spice in there that on the palate actually delivers a lot more than you you would realize. Yeah, yeah, and I think you know we were talking about a lot of other elements in the other single cast. We're talking about tannin. And dryness, um, and you know, caramels, but there was fruit in all of them. Yeah, which we sort of, I think, we sort of forgot a little bit about. You know, iniquity. You know, we're talking about Shiraz casks, you know, port casks, and you know, sherry casks. They're all inherently going to have quite a bit of fruit in them. So it just that wasn't the dominant thing. So actually, I think that's maybe where that comes from. Uh, one fifty, which was the young one. I'm actually going to go two mils of that. I reckon going back to nine ten, it probably a little bit more get up and go than I thought. And I, perhaps controversially, uh, hold on, I need some more. I need some more booze. Uh, no, I'll, no, I'll stick to that. That's fifteen mils. I'm going to leave one hundred nine out of it. This is my one only stab at this. The nose on that is awesome. 
It's nothing like. It's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's not, nothing it's like. Not 19. Really. <laughs> it's not nineteen whatsoever. But there's a like a butterscotch. Yeah. So what I've done there, he's got it wrong uh, essentially, but I don't mind that nose either. That's um, that's my little one. For all those punders out there, you can cap your samples with a coaster or something, which would actually give your nose a little bit of a rest yeah. as you're blending. And that's so like soda water, I find quite good as well. Mm. Um, just like not so much of those, but clears the, the tongue palate, which is a little bit hard to do sometimes. Well, the real... uh, thank you for Christian, who's just messaged me uh, both his and Daniela's uh, guesses from that one. <clears throat> Isn't it? Why, uh, why do you say guesses? Why, yeah, were well, there recipes? I don't know. I believe coffee, smelling coffee beans clears your, your palate and your nose. Mm. Although I've never done that's, it. That's my one. I'm going to dish out another bit of 19. Um, oh, by the way, uh, on the website, I'll post the link. Uh, batch 19 is available to purchase tonight on pre order. It's on its way to us soon. It's um, going to retail for 110 bucks, so 99 for members. Uh, but tonight we're doing it 99, so 89.10 for members. So you save about 10 bucks. That's true. Really no money, but that's all right. So I'll post that link at the moment as well. But that's in the new look 500 mil bottles that are, I think this is the debut of the 500 mils, isn't it? The uh, batch yes. Yeah, we, we've got 500 mil bottles in to put our vodka in when it comes out next month. And we thought that because time's a bit tired, a bit tough, and number 19 is not everyone's favourite number right now, that we might try introducing batch 19 in a 500 mil bottle with no fancy package, sort of $99 thing. So it's more affordable, basically. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it's actually it's been really interesting to see um, the habits of buying over the course of the past three months here here at the Oak Barrel. Um, obviously, we, we play in that more premium space, um, and you know there's been a real drive for for value. Um, the first two weeks, everyone went to chain stores and loaded up on 17 cases of VB. Yeah. About two weeks in, they got bored of that and said, "Okay, I need some whiskey to go along with it." Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's certainly been been the value of. <clears throat> I'm 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 not going to lie. I don't think this is. You know, it's not correct, but it's not not a world away. But the one thing I'm getting off going back to the 19 and doing them side by side is there's more like a resinous sort mm. of note. So my gut would then be to throw in more of one three four, which I said I was going to pair back. So you might have been right on that one. That sort of sweetness. Um. Somebody's asked if it's 46%, and the answer is yes, it is 46%. All the samples are 46. Somebody's run out of their batch 19. Well, that's a problem. <laughs> <clears throat> Raf's lost command of the English language. I'm not quite sure what he's saying. <laughs> this is this is a lot of fun. Like mm. I, I really enjoy this. And um <coughs> <coughs> I doubt that anyone's going to finish all 100 mils, uh, like all of their 100 mil samples. But yeah, like this is an ongoing conversation. I'd, I'd love to and, hear uh, yeah. um, what your uh, sort of, you know, your creations are, you know, in the future. And maybe just putting two together or maybe use all five of them. Um, you, can, you can see why we've gone ahead with it um, as a fun night because you can imagine 40 or 50 people making um, their blends up. And in a great atmosphere with, you know, with, when it's all, when everybody's back together again with a bit of food and having a bit of a laugh, it's a really good night. Oh, yeah. you're actually trying to create something. And worst case scenario, you got 550 mils of whiskey. <laughs> yeah. We did have somebody okay. drank all of our samples at the last show. Uh, that was six samples there. <laughs> Before he went home. <laughs> and interesting enough, you had the best blend too, but... Uh, he, there was a team of three, and he dictated the blend to one of his mates to mix it up to give us to judge. And his mate stuffed it up because he'd had too many whiskies himself. And although they gave me a glass and said, what do you think of that? It was the best of the night. It didn't win the competition because his sample was bugging up. <laughs> Not surprising when he'd had 600 mils of whiskey. So then what's the moral? Thank you. <laughs> Don't drink all your samples. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, uh, Chris, Christian comments um, in, in a message to me that 
they did four samples uh, between uh, the two of them there, and then they're, they're lost now. And I think that's important to remember as well that we're doing this in trying all these casts for the first time in a half an hour, 40 minutes, and then bang, go, give you 30 minutes to do this. You know, this, this takes weeks sometimes to do properly. So, um, yeah. Uh, Marco, Louisa made some caramel cupcakes on the weekend. Uh, so cast 134 sort of matches the caramel cupcakes. Um, and Peter Lockington joined himself on the couch. So that's always, that's the name of the game. Yeah. Depends what he's doing on the couch. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's, he's got your face on the big screen, so. <laughs> Have you, um, <laughs> moving on. Uh, Andy, how, how are you going? <laughs> Andy's you become less, less precise with his blends now. Yeah. I can see. I got, I got further and I'm getting closer. I still, <clears throat> that last 5% could be there. That, that can, you know, what I said at the beginning, there was that kind of Tokai, mm. um, sort of Sautern esque character. That's what I'm really struck, like, because you, you can pick it up, but I can't find it in. The sample. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's and so your mind goes, okay, well, and I, I think that's the the as you say, the, the great thing and the infuriating thing about blending is when you know the, the sum of two parts doesn't equal four. It's sometimes it's oh. you know minus two, and it's you know this this you know adds a new flavor, and all of a sudden you you've got this additional element, and then at the same time. That flavour that you thought, God, I really love that. That's that's going to come out if I blend in some of this, and and you actually then just completely lose that that flavour <laughs> because yeah. something else changes it, and it's it's infuriating. <laughs> <laughs> the fun of blending. Yeah, and I mean the the thing that gets me is I tend to get stuck on so you know say I'm I build on a base of fifty mils of of one of the casks. And then I use the other four to go around. I'm getting close and I can't quite get it. it. Might turn out that I should have just brought that initial cast down to 45 mils or 40. Mm. There's like there's so many variables at, at play. And if you're looking for that final piece, there's a million ways, as you say, to find that final piece. Um, well, there's, been, there's been a couple of times I've taken six blends home and I've tried them at the factory and I think, oh, they're okay. They, they'll, they'll do well. You know, I've gone on, gone on age um, and everything tastes good. And I've taken them home and it just doesn't work. Any way I do it, any way I do it, over a week or two, it just doesn't work. And that's frustrating. <laughs> but it does happen, yeah. So um, thank you to, to Ben. Thank you to Raf. Thank you to Alex. Thank you to Matthias. Thank you to Mark, to John Hitchin, to Daniela, to Christian, to Nizar. Uh, we've got your ones in there now. <clears throat> It's officially 8.20, but we're going to give you a couple more minutes to, to get your votes in uh, just quickly. Um, again, if you, if you don't want to do it as well, it doesn't really matter. That's It's all fun and games. It's not a – I don't have any Olympic medals to, to give out, but there is a bottle and a T-shirt on the line here. So it is it is worth – here's we've done yet. Yeah, Thomas Sutton, you probably emailed as well. Uh, Rebecca Charlton's come in there. Uh, Hannah Torley, that's a – she works for Four Pillars. That's something else. Don't worry about that email. Um, <laughs> Thomas Sutton, yep, I can see your one came through at 8.11. Yep, beautiful. Um, okay, so every, everyone's got in. I, I might call it in 30 seconds. It, everyone in the chat on any of the things, uh, say now if you need another 30 seconds because I'm going to ask some quite direct questions of the boys uh, right now um, in, in a second. So count it down from 30 to... Phil Brooks has sent his through. Hold on, I'll just um, open this up. I uh, can't open that up because I have done that somewhere else, haven't I? I'm sure it's all here. That that's all right. I'm, I'm sure I've got them all. But if there's if anyone, 15 seconds. If anyone doesn't have theirs in that wants to still get in, that's all right. 10 seconds, five seconds, two seconds, one seconds. It's 2020. The rules of time don't apply anymore. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so Damien says, rip the Band-Aid off, and I, I agree, Damien. <laughs> First question I want to ask, 
out of the five casks that you uh, supplied us with tonight, were all five casks in batch 19? No. No. Oh, okay. So pretty much everyone has supplied. <laughs> uh, including what Andy went back to on his final. Oh, no. So that's you cross that one out. Oh, just because it was crap. Okay. But so that's, <laughs> that's your final answer? Mm, no. That's, that's okay. That, yeah. <laughs> three, three goes okay. again. <laughs> there was um, no barrel 150. Sorry? There was no barrel 150. One, so the last one, really, the one that I thought gave that bit of zippiness and zest, yeah, that just whiskey wasn't in there. That, okay. was, that was the second highest proportion in every blend. And I did, I did call it. I did say, if you're a betting man, whiskey is my jam. Did say only four casks and none of uh, one five zero. Well, he buggered that up because there's no cask one three four either. Oh, okay, another curveball. <laughs> This is gonna. This is gonna. I'm gonna have to get an Excel spreadsheet out and punch all this in to find a winner. Yeah. Uh, so no one three four, no one fifty. Okay. Cask one. Sorry. Cask one two zero is thirty seven point one percent. Okay. Thirty seven point one percent. Which is a little bit less than I thought it was. I'm, but baff I'm baffled. We can tell that. I think your name was Andy. But never mind. Yeah. <laughs> Cask 108 is 32.8%. Okay. And that means that Cask 109 is 30.1%. So, funnily enough, I mean, within 10% of each other, within 10 mils. So, a relatively third, like third, far, third. Yeah, yeah, far closer to a third than I thought. Are you mm. trying to tell me that you won it? No, 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 no. It was not. pretty close. You must have been pretty close. Uh, no, I well, I had I left out cask one hundred and nine and had both one three four and one fifty in there, so I was pretty far away uh, from it, and I, and I had way too much one twenty in there mm. as well. Uh, yeah. Marco <laughs> Greza, it was is there an encouragement award, an award for last place. Um, we could maybe find a 200 mil bottle for last. Yeah. Look, um, yeah, look, there's a lot of emails. Jordan, thank you, got it in as well. Um, I'm going to have to go through this uh, and I might actually get back to... Yeah, so Tim Tim Lorking. And in fact, if you, if you reckon you got close as Tim Lorking picked the three casks... Um, please let me know because I might um, <laughs> look at your ones first. 109 was 30.1 percent. Yeah, so I'm actually I'll okay. I write them down. So I'll po post it here in the in the chat. So mm. 108 was 32.8 percent. Uh, 109 was 30.1 percent, and then 120 was 37.1. Percent. Now you blokes had us a bit of a, a bit of a disadvantage because I made fifty two sets of samples up. And I sent you fifty, but I included the extra two sets, so you got them all, and we didn't have the benefit of, of tasting the uh, the barrels tonight. We only got to drink batch nineteen, which wasn't a bad thing, by the way. <laughs> you know, when I put this blend together, I think I had about eight whiskies, and I was working for a couple of hours. As you at the max, and I thought, shit, I, I don't know, this this is just not working, you know. So I thought, well, I'll take the three best whiskies and I put a third of each into a glass. <laughs> that basically was it. Um, <laughs> I thought, left that alone, and I came back the next night and I thought, well, that's actually really quite good. So we just streamed on, lined it a little bit, and um, that's how the blend came about. Yeah. But the really nice thing is all the leftovers – got poured back into barrel 120, which we deduced was a nice barrel. And another year or so, we're going to have a lovely single barrel release out of barrel 120. Yep. Yeah. And, that, and that, that, that's quite <coughs> exciting. And I mean, I don't think anyone will, but um, potentially if you were, had the willpower to leave a little bit of 120 there, you could come back in a couple of years and be like, I remember this cask. 
before it got, you know, before the party happened and everyone piled upon it. Um, but maybe just write down your memories of what it was so you can see where that comes in two or three years. Um, <laughs> Yeah. People come in and saying, I was this percent wrong, that percent wrong. Poor Thomas Sutton was 103.8% wrong uh, on his <laughs> guess. Um, I think just having a quick look through on my phone there on the emails, coming through the messages I've got and various things, I think I have one, two, or potentially three people that were on the right track um, that I need to look at. But to be honest, uh, I'm, I'm not going to make an announcement now. I will, uh, uh, I, I might do it because I don't want to miss an email now and someone nailed it that I, that I missed to be thinking it's going to take a little while to get through that all. Um, but thank you everyone for, for playing along and, and sending that in. Um, people are sending in their t-shirt uh, sizes, you know, just in case as well, which I always, you know, can't hurt. You never know what might happen. Um, Chris, Chris Fletcher, can't wait for next trip to uh, South Australia. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, from, from my point of view, and this is something that Vicky might be able to help us with. Mm -hmm. um, here at the Oak Barrel, obviously, I look after all the spirits and then we've got someone who looks after all the wine and all the beer. And the the South Australian Adelaide trips tend to go to the wine department because mm -hmm. there's a lot of wineries down there. But I'm starting to... Uh, <laughs> yep. Wickedness. I think what you did tonight to us all was wickedness. Um, <laughs> of course, wicked. Yeah, so... That's the T-shirt. Um, so now that I can... You know, go touch the walls of iniquity as long as you still consider me a friend after this. Um, <laughs> Flew Flu Rio, there's the Never Never Gin Distillery. It's getting closer to, you know, people who are interested in whiskey and spirits as Adelaide being a decent airport to to get off at. Um, you know, what if, if, if someone's flying, looking for a trip to pump some money, and obviously Victoria is a mess at the moment, so let's go to, you know, South Australia instead. Um, what, what are the places that we should go and see in terms of spirits uh, well, yeah, in South Australia? Prohibition Gin in the city. That's uh, mm. around the corner from Ian's place, so you can visit Ian at home. That's very uh, easy to get to. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. There's a bunch of distilleries in our part of the town. In uh, There's a couple of gin distilleries, some of whom make uh, called um, uh, Imperial or Ounce Gin. They're just a 10-minute walk from us. Uh, there's Happenstance Gin, which is a two-minute walk from that one. Is there's the, another uh, place that makes the cures a couple of minutes walk from that. There's the Wheat Sheaf Hotel, which is a really, really cool place. No pokies there, just lots of beer. It's a good, uh, good hotel. There's, there's a lot of great bars in town. Yeah, you and, should make your own beer. And outside, uh, up into the hills, actually, the, the selection of bars going up into the Hillside hills. Hillside Distillery in the hills, uh, Five Nines, which is halfway up the hill. Trev Prima, which is in Mount Barker, he's yet to release a whiskey. His first whiskey is two years old, day after tomorrow. There's Gareth at uh, Flurio down on the peninsula. We've got Lot 100 at Nan, which is uh, a co combination of uh, brewers, gin makers, distillers, uh, cider he makers. As well. He makes food. that weird whiskey with wobble seed, which is quite mm. interesting to taste, but horrendously expensive. We don't <laughs> have uh, Rochford anymore. There's some interesting things going on with Rochford Distillery. Watch that space. Uh, what else do we have? Kangaroo Island, if you want to go to KI, the KI Spirits. Make uh, excellent spirits down there. And they do a, a, a very, very good barrel-aged gin as well. You like that one, do you? Yeah, I do. I rate it. The whole time I rate, I really rate that. Yeah. Vic doesn't rate it at all. Uh, <laughs> that's not unusual. Might be a different batch. Yeah. <laughs> different different mark barrel. As well. <laughs> Including one at Sepwood School Road, which is inspired by that TV series, um, Grand Designs. It's made out of shipping containers on the side of a hill. It's quite interesting. Um, yeah, there's plenty going on. There's 26 or 7 distilleries in South Australia. Okay. If you drive to all of them, you probably do about 400 kilometres, I would say. It's quite a long yeah. drive. If you're going to go one to the yeah. other. Yeah, and so what you should do then is be like me, is um, make some friends with bartenders and uh, pay them, you know, quite a, like <laughs> 100 bucks a day to drive you around. You, you'll save on the Ubers, I promise you. Uh, and, and just every time you should, when you land in South Australia and Adelaide Airport, go straight to Haynes & Co. first and get it, get into their um, break-even bottle. And you, you can say good day from Scotty from the Oak Barrel and say good day to Marcus, but 
I don't remember how I was the last time I left there. So that's either going to be a good reception or a <laughs> jolly sun reception. But, you know, try your luck. You never know what might happen. Yeah, Hans & Co is a very good stop. Highly recommended. It's almost smack bang in the middle of town. Yeah. Uh, easy to get to. Very relaxed atmosphere. It's got a cigar business as well. I think their fourth highest selling category is cigars. And people sit outside on the footpath. There's no car traffic going past and smoke cigars and drink whiskey and cocktails. It's, it's a really pleasant environment. For, for anyone, I know we've got people from all across Australia at the moment, but people from Sydney will appreciate this, is being able to drink a whiskey on the street. Yeah. Which I remember <clears> the first time I went there and they were like, oh, can you stand out here? I was like, you can't do that. <laughs> so there you go. There's, the police will tell you to move inside and they'll be, you know, there's a, no, no, you can do that's fine. And just like a license that you would never, ever able to get <laughs> in like Sydney CBD, let alone anywhere really, um, Haynes & Co can do. So yeah, it's it's a great treat for Sydney siders to, <laughs> to feel like Big Brother is not watching you while you're drinking whiskey. Oh, they're watching, don't worry about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on the other end of town, you've got Nola as well, which is a good little whiskey. Yeah. They tend to specialise in American style whiskeys if you're into that stuff. Uh, yeah. I think the, range, the range of bars that have popped up in Adelaide in the last five years yeah, is is phenomenal. Yeah, the the quality of the quality of the bartenders there, the, the quality of of the drinks, the variety, the service. It's yeah, you know, I think Adelaide. When I first started visiting Adelaide was was kind of the the sort of the additional bit of Australia um, in the sense of you know you've got Melbourne, you've got the bright lights, and you've got Sydney, and you've got the bright lights, and, and Brisbane. And Adelaide was sort of the second thought, and I think it was very much the yeah we've 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 got this new restaurant, and and that was the one restaurant that opened this year, and and everyone went there, and and then you wait another year for the next one. But it's now you know it's this incredible place, and there's yeah. there's so many bars and so many new things opening up that it's you know I I'm always really excited to go and visit, um, and. Pretty, pretty Sorry, just, <laughs> my, my phone is telling me the team list for the Swans games is out. So, so sorry about that. Oh, Scott, if you like if you like barrel aged gin, you go to Prohibition Gin. They had an amazing uh, Shiraz uh, barrel barrel um, gin. Put it in a, in a recharge Shiraz cask for a year. Amazing, really, really good. And Prohibition Bar Tub Cut is. Uh, like 70 yeah, percent yeah. i think like it was a serious serious gin <clears throat> um and uh damien it's been lovely to have you on the stream tonight but you just said go gws so you're getting kicked and banned and onto the blacklist um you must be you must be from adelaide as well though because all of gws supporters are all you know from south australia because no one cares about it here um, <laughs> when i start talking about aussie rules it's probably time that uh, we wrapped up the live stream uh, of this so um to everyone watching on the facebook and the youtube thank you for your comments uh, and things tonight um i want to say thank you we'll, we'll have a, a continued chat in the zoom for anyone who's wanted to stick around but thank you like this well i honestly didn't know how this was going to go <laughs> um, i sort of had a new how the original idea was going to go it's going to be a party um, and then we were going to like bring the pizzas in while the judging was done. So it's going to be going to be a lot of fun. Um, really fun. But um, yeah, thank you everyone for for putting your faith in in uh, in us in something a new concept. And thank you to you know to Ian and Vic for mm. allowing the Oak Barrel to run with their brand. And <laughs> could, could have gone either way, you know. There was no problem. It was always going to go well. Yeah. Yes. So a, big, a big pleasure, everyone. I think we've all learnt something. I've learnt a lot mm. um, from tonight. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, I'm going to kill the live stream so we can talk some rubbish. Cheers. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you.